Good evening, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Hala Elian presenting her new book, The Arsonist City. She'll be talking with Ruman Alam, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Hala, Ruman, and the team at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. But the exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. There are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. But if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting it there and not in the chat. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Arsonist City, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Halal's book and many others on site. Or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll be dropping a buy link in the chat in just a moment. As an extra treat, we have a limited number of signed copies uh, by Halal as she stopped by the bookstore on Monday to find copies of The Arsonist City. So if you'd like one of those, please make sure to note that you want to sign copy in the order comments field at checkout, and we'll be happy to fulfill those requests while supplies last. If you care about the supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured books is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Ruman Alam. He's the author of the novels Rich and Pretty, That Kind of Mother, and Leave the World Behind. He's also a great neighbor and supporter of Greenlight, and we're delighted to have him back on our stage again. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Hala Alian. She's the author of Salt Houses, winner of the, Day the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Arab American Book Award, and a finalist for the Chautauqua Prize, as well as four award-winning collections of poetry, most recently the 29th year. In addition to The New Yorker, her work has been published by the Academy of American Poets, Lit Hub, The New York Times Book Review, and Guernica. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, where she works as a clinical psychologist. Her new book, The Arsonist City, is a, rich family history, is a rich family story, a personal look at the legacy of war in the Middle East, and an indelible rendering of how we hold on to the people and places we call home. The book has been praised by acclaimed authors such as Mira Jacobs, Courtney Mom, Etoff Room, and tonight's interviewer, Ruma Alam, who says, I don't exactly understand how Hala Alian does it. Conjures love, sorrow, betrayal, and joy, goes from being funny and warm to incisive and thoughtful, but as a reader, I'm glad she does. The Arsenal City delivers all the pleasures of a good old fashioned saga, but in Alian's hands, one family's tale becomes the story of a nation. Lebanon and Syria, yes, but also the United States. It's the kind of book we're lucky to have. Hala is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with Ruman and with all of you. Please take it away, Hala. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Greenlight. Thank you, Ruman. Um, and thank you to all these. That's this is so many people. Thank you so much. For <laughs> for joining. Um, it means a lot to me. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful to have the, the support and the, the folks that I have in my life. So this is a, I should have thought about this before. How do I set this up? <laughs> this is just like us. This is a character who's walking through Beirut at night. She lives in Lebanon. She is a successful musician. She's in her late twenties and she's just, she's been drinking and up to no good all night and she is walking back to her apartment at like five in the morning. Her name is Najla, Naj. At this hour, the city has a narcotic effect. Ambient noise drips from the passing cabs, a French song, the sound of a man coughing, and the few people on the street share a certain camaraderie, nodding and smiling wryly at each other. Beirut is an insomniac city unfocused, filled with half-finished buildings and impromptu crowds. There has been a high-rise under construction on Naj's block since she bought the apartment several years ago. She'd lived in this neighborhood longer, though, since her move from America. The newer houses live dissonantly among the older, plain ones. 
The city doesn't change from neighborhood to neighborhood, but from building to building. And Naj is tired of remembering the former incarnations of places. The spa that was once a fabric store, the health food market that was once filled with antiques and toys. Her own apartment building is similarly disjointed. The glass entrance has been cracked since December, but there's a stupidly ornate chandelier in the lobby, refracting light on guests like Nefeti. The elevator hasn't worked in months. Abu Nabil, the building's cranky middle-aged super, lives in a small room next to the stairs, and someone decided to paint the stairwell a modern dark red but then apparently changed his mind on Naja's floor, where the walls of the stairwell become beige. Each floor has only two apartments facing each other, and Naj likes her neighbors, an elderly pair of widowed sisters who go out every Sunday in matching dresses and honest-to-God church hats. There's a hand-painted sign on Naj's front door that reads, Abandon all blank ye who enter here. The space intentionally left bare, and people have scrawled in things like Wi-Fi and bras. The sisters have never complained. Naj's apartment smells stale like something yeasty left out too long with undertones of weed, even though she hasn't smoked in days. Near the window, an assortment of plants droop in various stages of dying. Naj always forgets them. One second, she promises them, one second, then trots to the kitchen and fills a mug. She goes from plant to, to plant, watering the dusty soil. You get water, you get water, you get water, she sings out like Oprah. The water bubbles in the soil, then starts to drip onto the windowsill underneath. The plants remind her of her mother, of the swampy smell she'd bring home with her after a day at the greenhouse. The apartment is a three bedroom, too large for her, but over the years, the rooms have filled of their own volition with guitars and clothes and hosted a succession of friends who've left their exes. The electricity cuts off most afternoons and the balcony rail squeaks every time someone leans on it. The water runs hot for five minutes pops, but she loves it. And more than that, she loves the idea of herself as loyal to modest living. The apartment represents her restraint. She could buy in one of those high rises, but she doesn't. Her band's ethos is folksy. Naj had once been called the proletariat's duchess on the cover of a European music magazine. The amount of money in her Credit Libanais account frankly embarrasses her. Her father was furious when she bought the apartment. She was only 24, flushed from the surprising success of their first album, Proposal. It hadn't reached the United States, but sold well in Europe, taking off like a rocket in random cities, Amman, Kosovo, Athens, Riyadh. But the audiences seemed to have in common, used the Guardian article Naj had taped to the refrigerator, are places of censorship, corruption, oppression. The musical duo fronted by Naj, Ney Najla, creates an album of defiance with guttural lyrics, powerhouse performances, and most compellingly, a mixture of Arabic and English lyrics. So the listener might often be unsure of what is being said, but is happy to sing along. This is stupid, Baba, her father had thundered on the phone. Stupid. First, you say you want to study in Beirut, stupid number one. Then you say, Baba, I can't live with Jiddo, even though he is your grandfather, stupid number two. But okay, I pay for rent for an apartment five minutes away from our family house. Then, stupid number three, you make some money from your little band. Okay, great. But instead of saving or investing, you want to buy an apartment in Beirut? Baba, for what? For what? Stupid number four. I thought that was stupid number three, mock Naj. The little band had smarted. Baba, her father continued. It's like the saying we have in Arabic. Oh, God, Naj grumbled. Her father had an irredeemable habit of quoting Arabic sayings in English. A single mistake ensures a double misfortune. Baba, Naj interrupted. I get it, okay? I'm making a mistake. A stupid mistake, he corrected. A stupid mistake, fine. Except I don't think so. I don't have to pay taxes here and my friend Jono is a good real estate agent. It's going to be great. Can you try to be happy for me? Just practice it. She's the only one who can get away with talking to her father like this. It's not that hard. Naj, congratulations, she says. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Baba. Come on, your turn. A double misfortune, her father repeated. But the grave prediction had not come true. No disaster had fallen, befallen the apartment. Sure, the bathroom leaks during rainstorms and she can't fully close one of the bedroom windows. Twice the gas from the stove has leaked, the last time forcing the paltry fire department of Beirut to break her door open while the neighbors complained. But if Nash felt a slight unease when the doorknob literally fell out in her hand or when her bathroom mirror cracked, she pushed it out of her mind. 
scolding herself for being superstitious like her sister, who sprinkled salt on her children's heads when they were babies and always entered airplanes with her right foot. She purchased the apartment five years ago. Her father has only visited once. He shrugged after walking around the rooms and said aloud to the coat hanger as though Naj wasn't right there, she overpaid for it. Frankly, she would have paid double. She loves the apartment. It was the first place outside of the California home that became hers. She steps out of her sneakers now at the bedroom door, a vestigial holdover from her, from her mother's reign. No shoes in the house, what are we Americans? The floor cool and dusty beneath her bare feet. By the time she's gargled mouthwash, cursorily rinsed her face and heaved a pile of clothes off her bed, the sun has begun to rise, pastel as a baby blanket. Naj falls onto the bed with a sigh. She'll deal with her parents later this morning. She'll come up with a story. Everything will work out. From the street below, the sounds of awakening, a car engine starting, someone talking to a child, a female's voice rises up, bonjour, and Naj falls asleep. That's it. <laughs> so good, Hala. So good. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad that you read that section, actually, because it leads to the first question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, this is a book that is, you know, as we can hear from the title, it's really about a, a city. It's really about a place, um, the city of Beirut. And I wonder what your own relationship to that city is. I, Beirut very much feels like one of my homes on this planet. Um, it's a place where I've spent, I spent eight years of my life in Lebanon and four of them were in Beirut proper when I was doing my undergrad at the American University there. Um, it's a place that has a, there's, there's, a, there's, there's I think a, complica a complicatedness to being somebody who is at least part Palestinian living in Lebanon because of the, you know, how charged the history is there and because of the civil war and all of that. But it's also a place that while I have often felt like I'm not fully belonging there or fully from there or of there, it's also a place that really feels like, I don't know, I feel like I, whenever I leave, I leave my heart there. Um, mm. And that may have something to do with the fact that many of the people that I, have loved most in the world were, you know, were based there. My grandparents were there. Um, my parents were there. We have an apartment there. So there's, I think there's a lot to, there's a lot to do also with the fact that a lot of the people that I love have either been there or are still there. When you were writing this novel, were you writing it in New York? And was the Beirut that you were writing about a place that existed in your mind or was it a place that you could open your windows and see? So I go back, for a long time, I was going back twice a year, especially when I was in grad school. And then when I started working um, more full time, it became like once a year, every now and then a year would pass when I wouldn't go. And so I would say while I was writing this, I definitely went back at least once or twice. Mm -hmm. And so there were there was a heightened attention I was paying to the city knowing that I was writing about the city because the book really, I mean, a lot, like you were saying, a lot of it takes place in Beirut and it feels like a love letter to Beirut in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so it's very different to go somewhere that's familiar and just kind of be like, there's that, there's that sound. This is what it sounds like, you yeah. know, just without really paying attention versus going back and saying, oh, I'm going to try to like actually record this and, and, and pay homage to it and try to do it, like do it service. Um, and so that, that was definitely an element to it, but most of it was written, frankly, when I was in, in New York. I mean, I took yeah. advantage, we, we hung out in Austin and I like took advantage of yeah. being there to be like, I want some, some of these sensory details because I knew at that point that I'd wanted to write one of the characters there. So I took advantage. Oh, that's, of oh, that's so interesting. Oh, I was I there with you in Austin and then, oh, I love that. I love yeah. That. So, so there um, was so I, like most yeah. of it was written here, but, but I'm, I'm lucky enough that I've gotten to like travel a fair, I mean, not the last year, but I get to travel a fair amount. And so because of that, when I was going to the places that I knew things were going to be based and I was just kind of like taking notes and Mm -hmm. trying to be present. It's funny though, even, even in that section you read when we're in, we're sort of in Naja's perspective and she's seeing the place that sold this thing and then now it sells that thing. It reminded me so much of how Colson Whitehead wrote about New York City, that this sort of like this ever fluctuating thing. And that's sort of a common, it's a common aspect of like all of the great 
cosmopolitan places in the world, you know? And so it's a very, and what I loved about that attention to Beirut in a, a novel that an American is consuming is that it's talking about it as a cosmopolitan center and not as a, um, a, a geopolit as a political center, or a, a, you know, it's not just about a being a setting for political conflict. It's about being a city in itself. Right, because when you're when you're from a place, you are not thinking about it through the lens of yep. a headline that somebody five thousand miles yep. away is going to read. Right, you're you're it's it, that's not necessarily to say that you're not aware of the. I mean, think about people in the U.S. Right, like. It's yeah. like we're not not aware of the things that are happening, but we're also like, oh, that's like the coffee shop that I like, or this is, you know, yeah. this is the commute that I do every day, or this is, you know, yeah. this, this is, I love this like farmer's market on Saturdays. Like there, you, you yeah. are also of the place in a very granular, you know, minute to minute way um, where you're not just thinking of it from kind of that else. Because I do think that there's a roots of place that's really exotified and really commodified and really, yeah. you know, broken down to its pieces in terms of like history and conflict. And, and it's, it's a place at the same time that's really made out to be like very sexy and like the Paris yeah. of the Middle East. And it's like romanticized in these ways that I think are also detrimental to it. Um, so there's yeah. a lot of like the the externalizing gaze that's put on it, um, which I think when you, when you are really of a place, you're not usually doing that to the place that you're living. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, the Arsonist City, I'm gonna hold it up, is like, it, it, it's a significant book. It's, it's a big, big fat book, so it res it resists like easy summary. <laughs> and I feel like, you you know, when you're talking about your book, you're always forced to summarize it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that hard work for you. Oh my God, give you, bless you. I'm gonna give you what I think the summary of, of what happens in this book. So the audience who hasn't yet read it can understand what we're talking about. In, in the Arsonist City, this sort of patriarch of a family dies at the beginning of the book and leaves behind him the family home. And his son, whose name is Idris, who's a physician in California, and his wife, Mazna, have to return to Beirut to see to the house, to decide what will happen to their inheritance. This couple that has left the Middle East for America has three children. Their children are Ava, who lives in New York, cool, sexy lady who lives in New York City, <laughs> uh, Mimi, who is their son, who is a, an aspiring musician, but who works as a chef in Austin, and their daughter, Naj, who Hala read about before, who is a somewhat successful kind of punk musician in Beirut. And all five of these people end up in the family home. And as we know from all novels since, you know, Proust, right? Like you <laughs> get the family together and then you understand, you, Gradually, you understand how old some of the conflicts are within a family, how old some of the secrets are. Um, so what you're doing in the book is you're talking about a place and the way that you're bringing the place to life, the region, the history, the politics, the story is through this family of five people, although there's more than five because there are children and spouses, but is that a fair do you like that summary? Do you like the summary I, I just came up with for no. your own for your book? What if I were to say that was that's not actually at all what the book is about? This is we, so embarrassing to, for you. To end <laughs> no, I know you killed it. That's exactly yes. That's 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 beautifully summarized. So, the first time we meet Ava, who is the um, the oldest child of this family, she's the woman who lives in New York City. She has a husband and two kids. The first time we meet her, she's having sex with her husband. Yes. Um, I don't want to embarrass you by talking about sex too much, but <laughs> of course this is a novel about life itself and sex is a, a part of life, but right. there is something really striking to me about the choice to write about Ava and to write about her sister who is queer and to write about their own mother who has a sort of complex full humanity. Right. You give them all real sex lives. You give them all a sort of real dimension and it feels like, I wondered whether this was a sort of conscious objective on your part, especially in writing about women of Arab descent. So it, it, when we were talking before people came on, you were saying something that I was like, well, that's a very good point. Um, it was, I, it wasn't, I, I would like to say that I'd like sat down and really storyboarded it. It wasn't conscious as much as it really matters to me that my characters feel fleshed out and feel realistic and feel of the world. And 
So I, I mean, I take that as high praise because like you're saying, sex, intimacy, relationships, these are all part of life. Um, and, and I think, I think for me, what was different about this book than things that I've written before is I haven't had, I have not had as much real estate, so to speak, on the page to delve into particular characters' lives as much as this book. So the first novel was also a family story, also multi-generational. I have a type, <laughs> but it was also like there were more, there were more generations, there were more years, and we were really dipping in and out of people's like characters' lives for like a day, a couple of days. So we mm -hmm. weren't the camera lens wasn't really staying on any one character for very long. And I think that one of the freedoms of writing about fewer characters and being able to delve more deeply into someone like Mesna, who we see kind of come of age in well into her 60s, was was that I I had the I was allowed and I had the permission to really dive into their lives in different ways, to be able to say like, look, these are the things they want. These are the things they're ashamed of wanting. These are the things they desire. These are the things they're afraid of. These are the, th and, and, and I, you know, intimacy, sex, all of that is part of it. Um, and I think to what you were saying before we, we started the event of this like idea that like, you know, a lot of times like Arab female characters can be one dimension, especially depending on who's writing it, right? So it's like, is it written for like a white Western gaze? Is it written by a white Western person? Like, like a lot of times there is kind of a one dimensionality to it. And there can be sort of this like haram halal, like sinner or like, you know, like good girl kind of archetype um, that that's played up with. Whereas I think a lot of people are, are much more complicated than that, much more nuanced than that, including, spoiler alert, Arab women. Um, so I think that that was something that just, it, it sort of came up more organically like, while I was writing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just sort of like, I love the, it, it would make sense to me that you as a younger woman would be able to just, to discharge that, to write about modern young women but you also grant that to their mother. Yes. And that felt very surprising to me because I think we're accustomed to seeing a kind of, um, you know, a simplified version of like a chaste old Arab lady covered from head to toe with no <laughs> interior self, with no, like there's no sense of, and, and the, the matriarch in this family is not that at no. all. You know? <laughs> not no, that I all. mean, and I think that's, no, and I, I yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think that, once I decided that I wanted this character to be making like kind of dubious choices and to maybe not be living her life in, in a way that, that served even her that well, um, yeah. I think that that was sort of like all bets are off and she's going to be kind of a fully fleshed out person. Yeah, I, well, I really love that. I'm gonna just stop to remind everybody that I'll take audience questions in like 15 minutes. So um, feel free to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A thing, as Katie said, and I will I will interrogate Hala on your behalf. Um, so we heard in that section that you read, Naj, uh, who was coming home from a late night out, is a singer. She's she's an artist. Um, her brother Mimi, who works as a chef, also aspires to a career in music. Their mother, in her youth, aspired to a career as an actress. I had forgotten before listening to your bio that you're such a fucking overachiever and that you're like a celebrated <laughs> poet in addition to being a novelist in addition to being a clinician I don't really I can't really handle what an overachiever you are but <laughs> I wonder if you could talk about what it, it seems like that holds something about your own relationship to art itself <laughs> to art as a calling yeah I mean I so I think Part of choosing those characters was that I really wanted to, so again, with, with longer prose that I've done in the past, um, because of the, because of the, the, the time period that was being covered and like, because of where people were geographically, there were like geographical constraints and like era constraints that meant that I had to kind of think more conservatively or more traditionally in terms of careers. Whereas this one felt more like, I can kind of do whatever I want. So I was like, what are careers that I've wanted? I would love to be like a rock star. I wish I could sing. <laughs> I've always been interested in like, what is it like to be an actor? What is it like? I have like Mesna work at a greenhouse, which has always seemed to me like a dream place to work. So I was able to kind of just go based off of like curiosity and like interest and really delve into these different, um, different areas. And I do think that one of the things that happened to this point, to your question of like, what is it? 
what is it sort of saying about art or what is it saying about my interest in art and my own like, you know, thoughts about art is that writing so many characters that were so really sometimes to their own detriment, like really hell bent on artistic success. I mean, it, it, it made me kind of confront what like, these, these, what we like, I think there's two different things that we mean when we say someone wants to be an artist. There's like, I want artistic results. I want like, you know, I want to arrive at a destination where I've made a product and it's like done. And I want to live the life of an artist, which I take to mean like, I want to consume, I want to take in art on a regular basis and I want to create on a regular basis. So like process forces, like process oriented versus results oriented. And it, giving the, the characters these careers meant that I had to really delve into like, what's the difference? What would the difference look like for these characters? What does it mean if the results doesn't work? So with Mesna, again, she's sort yeah. of a failed, she has a failed acting career. So what happens to that artistic drive? What happens to that desire to be in the world in that way? Do you have to like find another avenue for it? Um, and yes, it feels like a compromise, but can there still be joy in that? And then also, frankly, just things like jealousy and competition and like, you know, like if you've succeeded once, what does that mean for the next time you try to put something out there? Like it just, it, it meant that I could, I was, I was faced with all of these questions that were really exciting and interesting to look into, which I, I never really had to be honest before. Um, like the, the, mm -hmm. the characters mm -hmm. kind of necessitated, necessitated that I look at it more. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you're saying, like you had a kind of a bigger canvas or you were, you were choosing to occupy more canvas. So you were, I mean, everything you do fictionally and, and probably even as a poet is sort of this, it's, it's an exercise of imagination, but this is one that you really gave yourself some latitude. Right. At the same time though, you are writing about a real place and you are writing about real histories. You're writing about stuff, facts and history that predate your own birth. Did you feel like, what did that feel like for you? Like, did that feel, you know, especially because you're writing a book, you you were writing a book that you knew was going to be published in English in the United States. Like, right. did it feel like an like there was a different kind of responsibility or, you know, did you have to like talk to your parents or your, your yeah. grandparents? Like, how did you sort of negotiate that? I mean, the first thing is that I, I'm not a historian, I'm not a political scientist and I get things wrong all the time. So I have people in my corner that are really, really reliable readers and know a lot about the region and know far more than I do about the politics and the intricacies of it. So the first three people outside of anyone in the publishing world that read the book were my brother, my father, and my friend, Michael Page, all of whom are like, know a ton about politics. Um, and some of, you know, my dad like lived through a lot of this stuff. And so, so to be able to kind of get like both primary and secondary sources, um, was really important. And that way was sort of similar to the first thing that I wrote. I think the, the difference is that with this one, you know, when you write a first novel, I'm sure it's like, you don't know if anyone's ever going to read it, right? You're not really thinking of audience in the same way. You're kind of writing it for yourself or like a select number of people. When you write a second novel, if you have, if you're lucky enough to be like, oh, there's some degree of readership or some, you know, some degree of an audience, you are now suddenly thinking about how is this going to translate? What do I need to explain? What do I, what am I going to demand the read? What work am I going to demand the reader does on their own? If they don't know a certain amount, they can Google it, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I think those were definitely questions that I was kind of negotiating, but yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, anytime you're writing about anything as, I mean, anything as complicated as like political, like the political history of Lebanon or the region yeah. um, is very overwhelming and very daunting. But I think it was made easier by the fact that I knew that I had people that I could ask. And I knew, like, yeah. I also knew I had people who would point me in the directions of what to research and what to read and kind of like what movies to watch, et cetera. Um, so I think that that really, that lifted a lot of the anxiety. Like knowing, I, I always yeah. say to people when they're writing a book, it's like your book is going to have like seven different lives, right? It's not like if you're going to be writing one thing but, and thinking that you have an idea, but by the time it's in anyone's hands, it's going to be a different creature. And so like, it's okay. You're going to have time to edit and rework things and, and massage things up. So that was, that's something that like yeah. quells my anxiety about writing. Well, also it's not a work of nonfiction. It's not a work of politics or news it's not a work of information like I wouldn't want to make it I wouldn't want to give anyone the impression that it's like a, a homework packet like it's a novel no. and it's yeah, using yeah. reality but you're right, you're right, telling right. a story about people who you 
made totally. up and totally. you know <laughs> like and, and an yet you kind of can't of tell I mean and yet you can't tell the story of people living in Lebanon in the 1970s or 1980s without talking about the civil war you can't talk about sure someone who like, you know, Mezna Syrian, you can't talk about someone who's Syrian present day going back to Lebanon without talking about like, so like what's happening in Syria. So there yeah. is, there's like a risk, like, I always feel like it's, it's like threading the needle for me of like, I'm not an ambassador on, of any of this. I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone. And also I have a responsibility to get like the facts right yeah. in order to build a foundation upon which I do like the fiction and the world building and the storytelling and all that. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk to you now about how you do what you've just described. Okay, so I already held up the book to show off that it's like a big fat book. Like I got, um, your editor sent me a manuscript of the book. Um, she said, oh, Hala has a new book. And I was like, oh, I'm so excited. Like send it to me. And she sent me the manuscript. And I was like, holy shit, Hala. Like <laughs> when did you, I don't, I don't understand when you, you know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that the heft of the book should be daunting. Like it's a beautiful book. And I read it like really quickly, but like just the sheer act of like, stringing together lives of all of these people over all of this geography and all of this time feels insane to me because I can't do it. Like I can write about like two people and I can write about like my last book takes place over the course of like three days. So I wondered if like, if you could talk about how you do that. Are you somebody who makes a lot of outlines? Are you somebody who like, mm -hmm. you write all of the sections about one character and then you do the next? Like how exactly do you proceed through a book like this? It's funny if I, I should have had it prepared but I have like behind <laughs> closet it's, it, it'll take some maneuvering so I'm not going to do it right now because I have to get up but I have the actual like cardboard that I storyboarded um, it on um first of all I find what you did which is telling the story over three days and keeping again keeping the camera lens tight to be so much harder than bopping around time because I feel like when you're when you're writing uh, over a larger period of time you can know, just man. leave you can be like you know what I'm done with that's true, that's true. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you in 1980 um but I I think so for me I know I keep referencing the first book, but it's because so much of what I learned in the first book informed what happened in the second one. So mm -hmm. with Salt Houses, I wrote in this really erratic, like kind of absurd way that was very much uh, motivated by intuition. So I'd wake up in the morning and do my half hour and be like, I'm gonna write something in the 1980s. Now I'm gonna go back to the 60s. Now I'm gonna, I was like kind of uh, motivated by curiosity and what I felt like writing. Mm -hmm. What that meant is by the end of it, I had hundreds of word, like, like maybe not hundreds, dozens of Microsoft Word documents that were titled things like argument here, conversation between this person. I had to go mm -hmm. back and stitch it all and turn it into something coherent. It was a hellscape of a process. And by the time <laughs> I was done with it, I was like, I'm never again doing this. And I need to know, like, I need to have a book, some idea of the book. So this one, before I started writing it, I storyboarded it. I took a lot, I borrowed a lot of elements from like script, like screenplay writing and things like that. It was very, I'm very visual. And so I just bought different colored note cards for different characters and different points in time and just kind of mapped out um, where we would be, what years we would spend there. And, and kind of which character's perspective we'd be in the different sections. And it made, and again, the characters ended up doing, you know, things happened that I hadn't expected they would happen. And they ended up doing, you know, like it, there were still surprises in the writing process and it was still organic, but I, I very much had a frame of at the very least where people would be at what time throughout the whole writing mm -hmm. process. And that made mm -hmm. things like, it just made the writing, like, I mean, I'm not, that makes it seem like it's so easy. I, there were days where I was like, I hate this. I'm burning it. I'm burning my laptop. This is the worst thing ever. Like, but it's, but for the most part, it made for a much more, like a much easier process and certainly an easier editing process. So your first novel is something that you were, you were experimenting the mornings before you went off to your job and like feeling your way into like, am I writing a book? Am I writing something? Is this all going to like hang together? But this novel, you were like, no, 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 I'm writing a novel. Yes. And the novel is about a house and it's right. about these characters and this is what's happening. Right. Can you, so as you were engaged in that process of like, okay, now I, I'm writing my second novel. I know what it is. I know what, you know, I know how it's shaped, but you were also working full time. Like, was this still something that you were doing like in stints, like first thing in the morning or did you give it a more sustained periods of attention? Like, how did that come together? So I, I've always, my, my practice is 30 minutes a day and it's kind of, that's it. <laughs> like I rarely do more than that. 
Um, if I miss the day, I actually, it's funny. Cause I remember your thing of like, you had to, you woke up in the two hours, like four in the morning or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always yeah, been in like such a, admiration. I can't believe that. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> yeah. mine is like, it's like half an, half, I will not, <laughs> mine is like half an hour a day. And it's just, and I, I'm, I'm a relatively quick writer, but there's, there's obviously a lot of edit. I write really raw, long, rambly first drafts. And then there's a lot of cutting and like editing and whatever. Um, but yeah, it's 30 minutes a day. And it's it's honestly just whenever in the day I do it. And that's like, that's kind of all I ask of myself. The difference with this one was I did do, I did a, um, a residency at the American University or American Library in Paris. And then I did a residency at Yaddo. Like I did a couple of writing residencies throughout the writing period of this. And it, that really actually helped a lot because I was given kind of several, I think twice, like several weeks, like three or four weeks of just like uninterrupted mm. time in this case, what was helpful was the research. It gave me uninterrupted time to actually do research and like read the things I needed to read to feel like I had a strong foundation to, to talk about the history and the sociopolitical situation. Um, so that helped, but I've never, I've never been someone who can sit and write for hours. I just don't, I can't. I, I have to say, I find that so inspiring. I hope that other people in the audience do too, that the idea that like, that dedicated half an hour of work can actually yield some real results. Like I think that it can feel like, you know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's like you're describing going to the gym and then coming out like a bodybuilder. Like it actually does happen. Like if you just go for half an hour a day, half an hour a day, like, yeah, yeah you just have to do it. it. Yeah. And, and you have, and I, my, my, like my system is like, I, at this point I've been doing it for so long that if I sit down and open a document, my brain just starts going like, okay, this is what we're doing. And it knows that for half mm. an hour, this is what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you, it, it, it's not like, I don't know. I feel like half an hour is not asking that much of you, but you, if you use the time yeah. wisely, it adds up. Do you think of, so as we heard in your bio, your show off bio up top, you're also a very celebrated poet. Thanks. Do you think of the muscle of writing fiction as distinct from working with, um, with prose? Wait, what did I just say? With poetry, is poetry. prose no, different no, than poetry? You. I got you, I got you. Like, you know, yeah. like, what is, are yeah, those yeah, different, yeah. like? Yeah. yeah, I think so. For me, it is. Um, I, I think it asks, it demands a different... Uh, so for poet, I, I think poetry, I can wait to feel inspired. I'm like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't write poetry for, for weeks, sometimes for months, I won't write a poem. And I never worry, I'm gonna jinx myself and never write another poem now. But like, <laughs> I, for the most part, I don't worry about poetry. I'm just like, it'll come when it comes. And i have it's kind of like a thing where like, I leave the back door ajar and I'm like, it'll come back in when it wants to come back in and we'll, we'll hang out. Fiction, if I just, if I left the door ajar and said when fiction comes in, I'll write a book, it would never happen. It, where fiction requires more discipline, for me at least, and it requires more consistency because if I were to work on a story and then not work on it, for, I was working on a novel and then I stopped around the time the pandemic started to work on nonfiction, I now have to go back and reread the 300 however long pages to just remember what's even going on, to be able to pick, like, mm. like, it's not something you can kind of pick up, at least for me in the way that poetry is like, yeah. I just, I think I, I, I trust my relationship with poetry more. Mm. That's so interesting. That is so interesting. Um, you just said something that makes me want to ask you what you've been writing during this past period of the year. You've been writing nonfiction. What have you, can you talk about what you've been working on or is it secret? <laughs> No, it's, it's so I, around the time that the lockdown started, I was working on a third novel, which I am again. I prom, I'm getting back into it. I printed it. I'm, I'm, it's coming back. Um, your your agent is watching, so you know. <laughs> no, there's a lot of it's all happening. We're gonna get to all of it. Um, but but I stopped, and there was something about lockdown and how weird life got, and how weird time got, and how intensely like. Um, like things felt very urgent and of the moment and very like, I, I found fiction and the imagination required to write fiction to be really hard to access. I found nonfiction much easier to get into. And I think there was something about, again, I think there's something about the fact that a lot of us were forced to spend a lot of times in our heads, which is an intense place yeah. to be. And in doing that, it was like, oh, actually there's things in here that I can write about that I haven't thought about. Um, and, it, and it sort of asked for more of an intimate, like direct, just like using the eye more in the writing. And so it just kind of, the nonfiction sort of came out organically. I'm working on a kind of like a, I've been calling it like a cultural memoir, um, 
collection of writing on the topic of erasure and the ways that mm -hmm. like there's kind of this top-down external erasure that happens to people often folks that are marg belong to marginalized identities um, and then the ways that that can translate into erasing ourselves and imposing erasure on ourselves through things like like an eating disorder or you know codependency mm -hmm. or substance abuse or whatnot so it's just kind of like a look at erasure in different forms Oh, that's so interesting, Hala. You really, you're such an overachiever. You, you, you're <laughs> shaming, you're shaming me for wasting the last year or so. Of I waste a lot of time. I can get Johnny in here, and he can tell you what time I wake up in the morning. <laughs> it's, it was like ten thirty. Yeah, no, I waste a lot of time. <laughs> um, one question that I really wanted to ask you is, um, so we've heard like the, your practice of being engaged in a novel is not like. I mean, beyond like being at Yaddo or being at the American Library, it's not like a deep monastic immersion. It's sort of like a, you're living with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm wondering um, what art you looked at or what you were thinking about that helped shape the arsonist city. Are there, like when you look at this book, do you see the legacy of like the movies, the films you were watching or the books, other novels you were reading? Yeah, I hear a lot of music. I listen to a lot of Arabic music while I was working mm. on the scenes in, in Lebanon, particularly like the Syria, Lebanon scenes in the 70s, um, which is something I, like if I'm writing in the past, I'm like, what was popular then? What was actually playing then? Um, I, I like, you know what? Actually, that kind of mother, you're, I swear I'm not saying this is flattery, but you're, I know, I know. Take Come on. Now. Come on. To God. That's like, that's one of the, it's because I remember, like, I read it when I was in Maine with my partner and my husband. And I, I just remember there was like something about the way motherhood, like kind of like the ambivalence of motherhood and the disappointments of motherhood, which is something that I definitely played with in the book. Yeah. Um, God, I swear. On. I already, I already, I already love you. Like, love I don't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I swear. That is, that is, that, and it might be, it's probably because you're the one asking it, but it's the first thing that came to yeah. mind. <laughs> but it's true. Um, I, you know what? It's kind of embarrassing because the, re the rest of the answers are like, I don't know. I rewatched How I Met Your Mother <laughs> at mm. some point when I was writing it. Not the, yeah. not the most highbrow art, but you know, I don't know. whatever I, gets you there. I, I think so too. And I actually think that the television sitcom is kind of a, it is a more sophisticated narrative tool than a lot of people are willing to grant. So too. You know, like it's talking to a very broad audience yeah. in 22 minutes punctuated by television commercials and it has to accomplish a lot. It has to move a lot of information forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're stupid as hell, but they're also, there is something to there is that populist about for. it. Yeah, and I do, I think in general, I because this was something that I I feel like I wrote it again, kind of almost like cinematic, like sort of almost the way you would think about a screenplay and how I storyboarded mm -hmm. and how I conceptualized it. I do, I do think there was a lot that I borrowed and took from like film and TV, not necessarily content, but just in terms of process of like, start with the prologue, right? Start the first line of the yeah. book, like today the man will die. So like start with the yeah. thing and then let's switch and go present day. And now we're in Park Slope and there's this like bougie middle-class couple having an argument, like how, wait, how did we get from like there to there? Like that kind of, you know, setting, setting things up and then thinking about how, if you're gonna set this up in the first few pages, what's the payoff going to be? And how are you gonna move the, yeah. the narrative and the plot in a way where like a hundred pages in, there's some gratification for the reader because now you've answered that question. So I, I do think actually there's a lot that I, I took from just kind of like cinema. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, we have some really good questions. Oh. I'm happy to ask more. So if there's anyone in the audience who wants to add to our list of questions, um, feel free to. Um, I'm gonna ask, I, I forced Randa Gerard to ask a question, and so I'm going to ask <laughs> her question. Okay. Um, Palestinian diasporic art so often names the pain and wound of displacement. In what ways did you want this novel to do that? I don't think I wanted it to as much as there was no way to tell the story of a family that is, I mean, 
as the story goes on, you you realize like that a family that that is Palestinian, Syrian, and Lebanese, like there's no way to tell that story, to tell a story of that of the region without writing in that displacement. And I think in a lot of ways, like I I you you know, in a lot of ways it's like, okay, this this was a book where I used a family to tell the story of you know, the region or a conflict or sort of like a geopolitical situation. But I, I think the reverse is true too, where it's like, I don't think I could, this family wouldn't be this family if they hadn't experienced the things that they did. You look at like the ways in which they are so hungry for the wrong things and, and looking for fulfillment in these, in these ways that are so motivated by scarcity mentality and scarcity of security and scarcity of attachment. And this is, when we talk about intergenerational trauma, this is like, these are the kids who are born and raised in California. These are not the, you know what I mean? These are not the, like, this isn't like the first generation that leaves. Um, I think, I think honestly, like, it's hard to answer that question without saying like in every possible way, like it's, it's something yeah. that trickles down to every part of their, their lives. And so, and so does like the joy of also that identity and, and the strength of that identity and, and sort of the ancestral, like, um, bolstering that comes from, from, from having that lineage, but, but I, but it's definitely both. Yeah, I mean, there's a scene in the book where um, Idris is holding his first child. Um, she's just been born and his wife can hear him telling the infant about the family home in Beirut. Like he's, he's describing yeah. this house. Like, so that tether between, yeah. you know, like there's this very intimate bridge between this vast geography Totally. And and hearing you talk about it, Hala, I, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like this is of a piece with your practice as a clinician, which is in talking to, like understanding people and um, whatever the sort of, the relationship between the immediate yeah. circumstances of their lives and the larger context of who they are, you know, as children, children of whatever it is that they're children of. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we're none of us are vacuums. We, I mean, we all yeah. we all come. Even the most like even the most lone wolves among us are tethered in in sort of irretrievable, irreversible ways to those that made us, those that raised us, those that cared for us, the places that held us, the places that you know we 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 long for, we return to, or we can't return to. Like there, we 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 are not made in isolation. None of us are. Yeah, yeah. This is a more like technical nitty gritty question about the execution of the book, but was there, this is sort of combining two audience questions, but I wonder if there was one character among the many viewpoints you occupy that was easiest for you to write or most fun for you to write. And I also wonder whether you felt like you had to kind of balance things across the scheme that, to make sure that you spent the same amount of time with every, with. All, both of the parents and all three of the children. So it's again, what something that I very much felt like I had to do in the first book that I let go of in this one, where I was like, I'm gonna just the story. The story is gonna lead me where it needs to lead me, and mm -hmm. if if that means that it's a little bit lopsided, it's fine because some aspects of the story really have to be told through the lens of certain characters. You know what I mean? There was just yeah. gonna be more poignancy if like Ava told one part of the story over Naj or whatever. Um, I think Najla was the easiest character. Maybe not easy, was, was probably the character I had the most fun with because she allowed me to inhabit Beirut and to kind of like return mm. to Beirut, um, both literally, but also just sort of imaginatively. I'd be sitting here in like a cold, like November day, kind of being like, yeah. oh, it's like Lebanon in the summer and there's an art gallery and there's like, you're flirting with someone in front of like a street court, you know, like, like to be able to kind of, um, I don't know, it just, it allowed me to do that kind of like, time travel and also literal travel in a way that was really exciting um, and allowed me frankly just to spend some time in my imagination in a place that I love very much and miss very much. Um, and, and Mesna I think was not easy to write but was very fulfilling to write because she is somebody that does really terrible things and in a lot of ways kind of like again the kind of irredeemable things and so it made it really important for me to find the empathy for, for her. And then once I did, there was this kind of daunting task of like, I need to, you know, not I need to, I would like to make it so that a reader leaves her 
and also kind of has an understanding for why it is that what it is that made her the way that she is and made her do the things that she did through some through some lens of empathy as well. Hopefully. I think so. I think so. I don't think you, I mean, I think she kind of breaks your heart because, yeah. you know, yeah, she, you, you, ha, you, The Arsonicity got an amazing review today in the New York Times. Um, I was actually going to read part of it, but then I was like, oh, the whole thing is so good. I would just have to read the whole thing. So I'm not going to do that because it's too boring. But um, in it, one, one of the review, one what the reviewer describes like this feeling of wanting to kind of shout at the characters to not do what they are about to do. Um, this feeling that like, oh, you're, you're messing everything up and I want to stop you from doing that. But I think and I think what she's saying, I think what that critic is saying, and this is what I felt, is that it's a measure of your success that at creating these people that you want better for them and you want to protect them from yeah. the mistake that they're about to make. But you know, if you don't make a mistake, then you have there's no novel. Like there, you can't write a novel about five people who everything is great all the time. <laughs> who, are, who just make wonderful life decisions at every turn. Always do everything right. Nope. Nope. There's no novel and then there's no life really, right? Like I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't know who among us is like just constantly making amazing choices and not getting caught in yeah. like, you know, certain like habit cycles or whatever. Um yeah, they are. I mean, they are. They are. They are kind of infuriated. Like they're infuri infuriating characters, and they again often are doing things that make their life worse. Yeah. But you know, I mean, so are a lot of us. Yeah. Well, yeah. welcome to the club, right? Welcome to the club. Um, so we've heard about this sort of the similar territory of salt houses and the arsonist city, which are which. Um, talk about the same geography, they talk about sort of the family, they, they move through viewpoints, they cover like a, a large family unit. Do you have a desire to try something different? Do you feel like this is your territory as novelist and that's how you always will conceive of the writing of fiction? Like mm -hmm. what's like, I mean, I know when I like, by the time I got to the pub date of all three of the books that I've published, I was like, oh God, I've never, I never want to write a book again. I never want to think about a book again. I never <laughs> want to do it in that way again. Do you feel like, oh, I never want to do that again? Or I, that's what I do. And I, I want, I can't wait to get at it again. I think it's, I, I was smiling when you were asking the question, because one of the things my dad said when he read it was like, beautiful book. I'm so proud. You did a great job. Uh, stop writing about arrows. <laughs> 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 I think what he meant was kind of like, like what other what other identities can we inhabit? What other things, what other stories can we tell? What other, you know, and it was said with a lot of love and a lot of like pride. And I, I, I kind of, I mean, I do kind of resonate with that where it's, it's not that I'm like, I love telling family stories. And I obviously, I think virtually everything or if not most things that I write will always be in some way or another tethered with that region or with my identity or whatever. Um, but I have been, write it like the third novel the one we're returning to i promise michelle is is more <laughs> is more of a thriller and it kind of like is more of like somebody whose college roommate gets murdered and a sort of like 10 years 10 15 years later kind of trying to figure it out um retrospective like retro retroactively kind of figure out what happened and that like kind of just breaking the the frame and breaking the format of what I've been doing for two books now, which is like, you know, if you add up all the years of writing, like four years, five years of writing, I've been doing that and I, it's, I've been loyal to it and it's been loyal back, right? Like it's, it's like, yep, if you do this and this and this, this, this is what's gonna happen. Um, breaking that has left me a little bit unmoored and unanchored in a way that's really exciting because now mm. suddenly I'm thinking about plot and structure in a very, very different way. And to be fair, like, I mean, the arsonist is super different than Salt Houses. It's much more modern. Yeah, it's, for you know, sure. It's yeah. a very, very different story. But there is that similar frame of like a family story. And there's some like going back and forth between the past and the present. Um, and the, the thing that I'm working on now is just more like in the present. And that has been, it's just been, yeah, it's just like kind of scary and also kind of thrilling to be like, oh, you, you, you don't know how to do this and you have to learn how to do it. It reminds me of writing the first book all over again. Oh, I guess that's a good place to feel, to be, where you feel like a little afraid of what you're about to try or yeah. that you're, you know, interested in trying something new and different. And I, you know, no disrespect to your father, but I don't think you should stop <laughs> writing about Arabs. <laughs> no, and I think he meant, he meant it very like facetiously and like tongue in cheek. To sort of, like, but I, was, I think, I think what he, I think what he was saying too was kind of like, 
it's like really exciting to see what you can, like, what, can we see what else, you, like, what can you do with this with different like places and different locales and different backgrounds, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the same time, you know, it, it's clear that you're writing, you're talking about material that feels very urgent to you, that this is what you care about. But at the same time, you're an Arab woman writing in the United States, you're writing in English, you're writing for an American publisher. Like, there, do you ever feel like there's this expectation or there's this burden for what it is you have to be and what it is you have to do on the page? Or do you not feel that? I mean, I do, I do a little bit. It's not, I don't, it's not something that's said, but I, I think there's a little bit of an, like, it's something that's kind of implied. And I think that it's, it's more of a cultural thing than something that's like bound to any particular publisher or anything that one particular person is, is kind of like communicating. Sure. Um, but I think there is a way in which you, I don't know. I think that there's a way that maybe I have kind of internalized this idea that maybe that like, you know, what, what are going to be the most interesting stories that I can tell? What are the most interesting parts of myself? What are the things that I am personally yeah. most equipped to do well? Um, which is what makes kind of like stepping out of that frame to be, I mean, that's why I kind of think in some ways like my father's advice, it's sort of revolutionary advice because it's sort of saying like, don't like, you don't have to stay within this frame. You know what I mean? Like you can step out yeah. of it. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to tell Arab stories because you're Arab. You can, if you want to go for it, but you can also tell any story that you want. And I think that does kind of, there is a little bit of a token organization that I, that I think just happens implicitly, systemically, yeah. when you're like someone of a certain background that's like telling stories from that background that's kind of like, okay, yeah, these are, this is good. This is like, this is your wheelhouse and stay here. And I think there's a way that, that you kind of internalize that without even meaning to. Yeah, it's a complicated, it's a complicated thing, but yeah. we should say that you do it really well. You do it so well. Yeah. The Arsonist City, this is the book. It's such a beautiful book. Thank you. Everyone should buy it tonight. <laughs> um, I think Katie's going to come back on and tell us how you can do that. Hala, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Congratulations such on this pleasure. beautiful book. It's really such, a, you know, especially in a moment where none of us are getting on a plane anytime soon. This is like buying a plane ticket. I mean, I really did like, you're also, we didn't even talk about the fact that you're so good at writing about like food and taste. And like, I really felt like I was... <laughs> Yeah, I'm so I'm so sick of being in this house and eating like instant ravioli and right. like, dealing with my kids. And like I just felt like for a minute I was like, oh, I'm in Beirut, like I'm I'm somewhere else. And so that is really a gift. But the, the whole book is a gift. So congratulations to you on this. Thank you so much. Blog. Thank you for this. Yeah, I really appreciate this. Oh my god. So so fun. Thank you both for that fantastic discussion. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, if you miss any of tonight's event or if you just want to watch it again, we will be posting it to our YouTube, so please look out for it there. And don't forget to buy your copy of The Arsonist City in-store online at greenlightbookstore.com, making sure to mention in the comments field to check out if you would like a signed copy. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.